Center is uh, Gordon Smith. Uh, he recently joined the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center as an associate director. Gordon began his career in concrete pavements by working for an IO Iowa concrete paving contractor, uh, Central Paving Corporation, for 14 years, followed by 31 years of service to the Iowa Paving Concrete Paving Association and the Iowa Ready Mix Concrete Association. added up to 47 years or something like that. That's a lot of concrete, isn't it? So good afternoon or morning. I guess it's still morning. So it's good to be here. I had the opportunity to uh, join you last year and talk a little bit about overlays. And, and uh, one of my new responsibilities with the CP Tech Center as I joined them about a year and a half or so ago was to work on the PEM initiative. And uh, certainly been a pleasure to do that. And I probably will echo a little bit of uh, what Jennifer shared and expand on that a little bit. And I know uh, that we've got uh, Pat and, and Dave and Jim Grove are going to come behind me to uh, add some more depth to it. There may be a few things you might hear more than once, and that's okay because some of them do bear repeating. So uh, we'll get into it because I know we're running just a little bit behind here. Uh, but I want to try and give you just an overview of the Performance Engineered Mixtures Program approach that we're using. And uh, it's, it's an exciting program as we start to look to the future. And one of the things that Jennifer mentioned was the importance of the partnerships working together with industry and agency and, uh, and academia to, uh, to accomplish this type of thing. It's not going to happen overnight. We've got to, this is a major, major change for the industry. And uh, we've got to be sure that we get everybody on board and pushing the same way and make sure that we've got the right tests and, and that type of thing. So I'm going to give you just a little history about how we got to where we are. I, I, with being in the industry for as many years as I have, I've seen a lot of concrete, maybe not as old as some of these jobs, but I had a couple Iowa projects that I threw up here. One of them's a city street up there in the left-hand corner. It was built in 1904 in Lamars, Iowa. I think they replaced that sometime in the uh, 1980s. Uh, there's a, another road up in the, in the right-hand corner uh, which is a cemetery road in Eddyville, Iowa. It was a county road that was built in 1908. It's still there, still working. Of course, they don't get a lot of traffic necessarily to the cemetery. Uh, not, not a lot of truck traffic anyway. And then our first um, major uh, primary highway project was the Seedling Mile on Lincoln Highway, Highway 30 in uh, eastern Iowa. So we've been building concrete pavements for a long time, and I know that you have here in Pennsylvania also a long uh, heritage and history of concrete pavements over the years. And we've known over that experience that a lot of those pavements do last for 30, 40, 50 years. We've got some of the original 5,000 miles of uh, primary highway that were built in Iowa that are still out there. They're probably covered with asphalt today because of most of those that first 5,000 miles of pavement was built uh, prior to 1936 or 1937. But there are a few of them out there. We just had a, a project. We uh, rebuilt Highway 20 out in western Iowa, and actually, actually we did a shadow PEM project on that, or on that uh, stretch of roadway uh, this last summer. And there was a, a piece of that old Highway 20 uh, that uh, actually was 98 years old and they put an asphalt overlay on it this year. So first time they had done that. So anyway, we know that they work pretty well. But we've got some new challenges. And uh, Jennifer alluded to that a little bit. You know, what we're seeing around the country, and especially some of this is in the, in the freeze zones and, and uh, places you get ice and snow and have de-icers. And you know, I thought I was coming out here where it's going to be nice and warm and everything. I left uh, Iowa on Monday and we'd had seven inches of rain or seven inches of rain on Sunday and we were supposed to snow seven inches of snow on Sunday and we were supposed to get another eight yesterday and it ended up being four and we're only talking about ten or something like that here this next weekend so but it's an issue things are changing and we're starting to see some incidents where our pavements aren't lasting as long as we would normally expect them to last and we've been spending a lot of time since probably 2003, 2004, uh, working with the National Concrete Consortium to try and look at some of those things that are going on. And it's not just uh, in Iowa. I mean, here's a, Rich shared this, Rich and John shared a picture of a taxiway on an airport here in Pennsylvania 
where there's certainly some joint issues going on. This was a, a road that I looked at in Iowa on a county road this last summer that was nine years old, and uh, certainly there's something going on there that we need to have some answers for. Now, when you look at the whole perspective of this, this deterioration is maybe only occurring on, you know, eight to 10 percent of the roadways that we're building out there. But, you know, if you're the person that owns that roadway, eight to 10 percent isn't acceptable. And I think as an industry, we understand that and we want to work together uh, in this endeavor to make sure that we've got good, reliable uh, pavements out there. As we look at this in the past a little bit, we realize that you know, we haven't changed our specifications for concrete pavements a lot as far as the durability or the quality of that concrete itself. You can go back into some spec books that are pretty old, and what were the things that we usually look at? Slump, air content, and strength. Still the most common test methodologies that we're using today. But what we would also know is we've talked about it over the last several years that really slump has very little correlation to durability. It does not necessarily measure the quality of the concrete, might measure the consistency, but it's not whether it's consistent good concrete or consistent bad concrete. Air content uh, has a poor correlation just itself in durability. Uh, certainly we know we need air, but more importantly is the distribution of the air in that concrete, and the air content doesn't tell us anything like that. We had some projects in, uh, in the 1990s uh, when we started getting gap-graded aggregates because of what was going on with superpave. We had gap-graded aggregates in the concrete industry. We weren't paying much attention to it. They still fell within the specification, but uh, we were just vibrating the dickens out of them. It was the same time that we were coming on with smoothness specifications, so the contractors were concerned about that. And uh, we, we realized that as we looked at it, and we're getting some deterioration in 10 years, that you know the air system on it was the spacing on the air was terrible, and uh, so we've learned a lot. And then, of course, strength. You know, we still have to be concerned about strength from a design standpoint, from the traffic loadings and stuff. But strength is not necessarily an indicator of durability. In fact, we're finding in some instances that when we put the high cement contents in some of our mixes, that probably is more detrimental to the durability than it is helpful. So we've got to do a better job to ensure durability. Things have changed. When you look at 1967, you know, or something like that, you know, we were probably primarily working with cement, water, rock, sand, and air and training agents. Uh, today we've got supplemental cementitious materials, non-Portland cements that are out there. Uh, a lot of admixtures will do many good things. Intermediate aggregates, limestone uh, uh, substitution in our cements and that type of thing. The demand's different, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we were still looking at seven day cures or maybe even 14 day cures on some pavements. Today, we want it in days for sure, if not hours, when we're dealing with patching and that type of thing. Curing, it used to be in the weeks. I've got pictures of uh, when we did water curing, uh, ponded water on the pavements back in the 20s and 30s and 40s to do the curing. Today, again, because we want to get traffic on it, we're going to cure quickly and uh, we're going to have traffic back on there. De-icing is probably the one that causes us the most concern with some of that joint deterioration that you noticed in those other pictures. The de-icing chemicals that we're using today versus the sand and salt that we used uh, 30, 20, 30 years ago are much different, and they're behaving much differently with our concretes and with our pavements in general. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at also is the, the way that we're putting the, the uh, de-icing uh, agents on the pavement. We're doing, I don't know whether you're doing it here, but in, in Iowa we're doing a lot of brine uh, where we come out and treat the pavements before the storm, which, you know, from the standpoint of, of uh, safety and making sure that we're removing those, uh, that ice and stuff, it's working phenomenally well. And nobody's going to change that. But what we have to do is we have to adjust our concrete to be durable to that type of uh, system. And one of the things that it does is when you put the icer on a dry pavement, it goes right down into that pavement system, and it, that's sitting there, which is good for de-icing, but not necessarily good for durability. Design lives have changed. I'm, I know you're talking about your long-life concrete pavements, as, as are many people around the country, so we have to look at the fact that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we were thinking 20-year designs, and 
those pavements that we built, yes, they lasted for 30 or 40 years oftentimes, designed as 20, but if we're going to go to 50, 60, 70 years, we've got to look at what we're doing. And then the other thing, and Jennifer mentioned that a little bit, is the knowledge base is changing. Uh, like it or not, we all realize that the expertise, uh, the number of people that are involved in, in concrete, asphalt, or whatever it is that many of our DOTs is changing. Uh, they don't have the funding to do a lot of research anymore. I'm, I know you guys are doing quite a bit here, but I'll tell you, there's parts of the country we're not seeing anything. And I think the industry has to step up to the table and become more involved. You know, I was a contractor for many years, and I worked for 30 contractors for even longer than that. And one of the things, you know, early on, I mean, the DOT solved all the problems. The DOT told us what to do. They gave us the recipes, and uh, that worked fine. But as we lose the expertise, as we lose the research, then I think we're now at a point where industry has to step up, and frankly, with the changes in the products that we have, we need that expertise because they're the ones that are involved. Uh, the cement companies, the aggregate companies, the contractors are deeply involved in those advancements. So what this whole thing was about was a partnership of agency and industry. And Jennifer told you it was to make good concrete, specify the critical properties, and design the pavement mixtures to meet those specs. We had a lot of discussions. We talked in, in the early 2000s about aggregate durability and gradation, chemical reactions, alkali silical reaction, ACR, poor air entrainment, poor consolidation workability. We talked about whether sawing practices might be causing some of our problems, effects of de-icers and de-icing practices, uh, the SCMs and the admixtures. Many, some of these things are things that maybe we needed to employ more than what we had in the past. There was a lot to learn. And we, like I said, we started this discussion with the National Concrete Consortium, uh, 32 states that meet twice a year to talk about concrete pavements. Pennsylvania is a part of that uh, coalition. And uh, there was a smaller group of people that got together, DOTs and industry that got together to start to, to look at what we might want to do. What they came up with is we really needed to modernize the spec, to require the things that matter from a durability standpoint and to measure them at the right time. What it would involve is development of test methods, some new test methods to look at the properties that we felt were important, develop a guide specification, and to develop tools for portion mixtures. Eventually, as we starting, are starting now, we're going to be conducting shadow evaluations so that contractors can better understand the tests, so that DOTs can better understand, so we can decide whether these are the right tests. We're not absolutely sure yet, but we've, we've got to move forward with it and try some new stuff. Later, we'll have guide, we'll guide and monitor some pilot projects around the country and develop a percent within limits models of, uh, for quality control. And, and uh, as Jennifer mentioned, eventually probably get to the performance uh, specifications. So how do we get there? What are we looking at? This, I know you can't read this real well, but it, what we did, we ran the road through all the, the, the uh, states that are involved in the, uh, the darker states that are involved in the, in the initiative. And what we really, as I said, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to get set up to move forward with this. Now we're into the area, and it varies from state to state, where we're doing some uh, shadow projects. We're looking at technical assistance for the states, trying to help them uh, doing performance monitoring, technical training, uh, test refinement. We've got our academic, academians that are working on that, and then we're looking at specification refinement. It's a long process. We don't know how long. It's going to be longer in some states than it is in the other. But this is kind of the path that we have to take, and we're moving along very well in that. Those properties that we talked about and Jennifer mentioned was shrinkage to reduce the preventable cracking, transport or permeability of the concrete to reduce the transport of aggressive, unwanted fluids in order to survive that environment. That's the one that's very key to the, uh, to the de-icing chemicals freeze-thaw durability, which we all pretty well understand, aggregate stability to eliminate reactive aggregates that sometimes destroys our concrete with the ASRs and ACRs, workability to improve the placement that impacts the durability and improves rideability, and strength to just ensure concrete pavement carries the intended vehicle loads. It's not one we're nearly as concerned about as others. The tests that we are looking at are V. Kelly and box test uh, for workability. Resistivity and formation factor for transport, 
uh, dual ring for shrinkage and the SAM or super air meter for cold weather resistance freeze thaw. And I think Jim's going to get into a little more detail on those tests. The group spent a significant amount of time for the first couple of years putting together a standard practice for developing performance engineered concrete pavement mixtures. It's called PP84, and it's re we're revising it every year. It's a national document, and uh, it's, a, it's a guide document. It's not a construction spec per se, but a lot of the information is in that, and uh, that kind of guides us a little bit. It tells us kind of how and when do we measure things. You know, uh, for, for shrinkage and, and freeze-thaw durability, aggregate stability and workability, that's probably a, a mixed design, you know, uh, a pre-qualification type of thing. Uh, when we're looking at transport, we think that is one with resistivity that could be both mixed design probably or quality uh, QC or acceptance. Uh, you can kind of see that I'm not going to walk through all those, but the, the, uh, the specification kind of gives us a little feel for that. The other one that's important that we're trying to look at is when we have a problem out there, if these tests are showing us that we've got a problem, how do we respond to that? And what we did is we looked at it a little bit, like if we've got a problem with shrinkage, uh, the tests are showing us there's an issue there, we need to look at paste content. If there's a problem with transport, we probably need to look at water cement ratio or uh, the SCM type and dosage. Freeze thaw durability is air voids. Aggregate stability, again, we can temper some of that with SCM type and dosage. Workability is a paste content issue or aggregation. If it's a gap graded aggregate, we're going to have problems with workability, and of course water cement ratio would be the one that we look at with strength. Uh, you saw the picture of the 17 states that are currently involved. We're talking to some others about getting involved, but it is a partnership. Uh, Federal Highway Administration is putting a million dollars a year into a pooled fund uh, that was established in 2017. The industry has uh, brought in a million dollars for that endeavor, and the 17 states together uh, have uh, amassed a little bit over a million dollars for this endeavor. So we, everyone is at the table. I'm the guy that's, one of the guys that's kind of in the middle of all that trying to keep these folks uh, happy and it's, uh, it's quite a challenge sometimes, uh, not only from the standpoint we're all over the map as far as where, where our progress is, but you know, we, sometimes the industry, do, people don't really agree with with the agency people, not very often, but once in a while, we've got to kind of work with that, but we're making great progress. The PEM team is Gina Alstrom and Mike Prawl from Federal Highways. Our researchers are Dr. Jason Weiss and, and Dr. Tyler Lay. Uh, Jason's at Oregon State, Tyler's at Oklahoma State. Uh, we've got Tom Van Dam from uh, NCE doing some of the data work for us, and Cecil Jones, uh, who used to be with North Carolina, he's a consultant with uh, Diversified Engineering Services, got a lot of contacts with Ashto. He worked with us a lot on the PP84 uh, specification. And then Dr. Peter Taylor, myself, and Jared Gross are the ones at the CP Tech Center that are kind of helping guide things here a little bit. It's heavy, the, the pooled fund is heavy on implementation, education and training, adjustments in the spec based on the field knowledge that we're starting to collect, and continued development of a knowledge base. We're really trying to get some comfort level on it. Here's an, just a little, I'm not going to read through all that, but to give you a little bit of an idea of the things that we did this last year, we had uh, three open houses, Colorado, Minnesota, and Iowa. Uh, we had uh, uh, shadow tests in South Dakota and Iowa and here in Pennsylvania. And uh, there are uh, quite a few of the states, as you can see there in the middle, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, New York, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Illinois have applied for that uh, uh, incentive funding from Federal Highway Administration uh, on shadow projects. And so there's quite a bit of stuff, collaboration going on in that. I'm going to divert for just a minute here as we finish up to talk a little bit about the quality control aspect. Of These are a couple of slides that I borrowed from my good friend Mike Prawl with Federal Highway Administration. but. You know, from, from the contractor standpoint, and, and, and we all understand that, whether agency or contractor, you know, this whole, this is a manufacturing process, and there's a lot of sources of variability that we have to deal with, and that's where the quality control comes into play, and probably will become a much more important aspect as we move into these new tests. The, the quality control, as far as the performance engineered mixes, acknowledges that there is a key role, uh, it requires an approved quality control plan. 
and it's going to require, require some QC testing and control charts, which we're starting to see now as some of the states are doing their uh, shadow projects. Mike always reminds us that, you know, this is concrete evolution, something we haven't seen maybe as much of in the last several decades, but he kind of talks about it as being concrete super pave. I keep telling him it's going to be better than super pave ever was. And, uh, but it is a very significant level field advancement, and it, it's going to answer the question, and Jennifer again, I think, alluded to that, with our loss of staff and resources, especially with the agencies, how are we going to be able to get the job done in the future? Probably moving in this direction is the answer as we look a little bit more at performance-related specs, and uh, certainly the collaboration is important. You know, the goal of PM is to st understand how critical properties relate to the performance. And the PP84 gets us started on that with a range of options. Initially, what we're seeing is prescriptive options prevail uh, with many of the states as we start to learn, but they're looking at these new tests. And ultimately, we think performance options will allow innovation and cost effectiveness on the contractor side that's going to make it uh, desirable for everybody. So we're working on that hard. Here are the uh, states that have been involved in the implementation funding. Uh, a number of those uh, have, have done different portions of it. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to get into the, the detail on this, but you can see here on the left-hand side the states. Uh, the, the incentive funding was divided into four categories. One was to do two or more actual PP84 uh, tests in the mix design of a process. You can see here how it kind of played out uh, with the various states, and Pennsylvania's in there has been a part of this. Obviously, in fact, they're doing all four of the uh, aspects of, of the, the uh, incentive. Here's the next category is for one or more tests in the acceptance process. You can see there's quite a variation in there in some of the states and what they're looking at. Uh, then requiring a comprehensive QC plan. Uh, not as many states are participating in that. Uh, I think there are only five uh, that are doing that portion of the incentive. But again, Pennsylvania is right up there uh, working on that. And I'm sure Pat will probably talk about that a little bit. And then finally, requiring the use of control charts as called for in Asheville was the fourth condition. So a lot's going on. What we're looking at this year is a one-day engineering level PEM workshop. We're trying to get a, out with the DOTs whenever they're ready to have us spread the word a little bit more with their people, working also with the contractors. We're doing a lot of spec review with the states to make sure that uh, as we look at their specs, that they've got specs that, that uh, dovetail very well with PEM as we start to to implement some of that. Some more shadow testing. I think there's four or five states will be doing shadow testing uh, this year. And we're uh, working with Federal Highways, uh, with Jogan and his, his folks uh, on the uh, doing some open houses in conjunction with the trailer uh, that you see out here and the equipment that you see. And, uh, and so there's just a, a bunch of stuff. It's going to be a long process, uh, but we're seeing some states that are starting to make some pretty good uh, progress towards it. So we feel the framework is in place and now we're all about discussing and focusing on the details of implementation. Don't panic because uh, we're not going to start this tomorrow and say you got to have a performance related spec. We're in the learning mode and everybody's working together at it and I've been uh, I've just been really tickled with the contractor response to it as we've worked with the contractors that uh, around the country they you know, up in Wisconsin, the contractor on one of the projects up there found out that the trailer was coming to the job, and he actually was suggesting that maybe he would shut the job down for the two weeks that the trailer was there because he was fearful. He didn't know what, what that meant. But the, it worked. The jogging and the folks went up there, and uh, when he got all, when we got all done, or they got all done with the trailer and showed him the test and, and that type of thing, he says, why didn't I know this before? He says, this has made a big difference. We worked with him on some mix design stuff through this tech center, and uh, he was talking the other day about how much money he saved, and, and we've given him a better quality product at the same time. So, uh, and I'm sure Dave will talk about some of their experience. So with that, that's kind of the update, where we're at, where we're going. So thank you, Pat, and everybody.